Well, good afternoon. I'm Carla Williams Scott, Director of the City of Columbus Department of Neighborhoods. And thank you for joining us for our final Lunch and Learn series of uh, 2020. I appreciate the Columbus Women's Commission and the Women's Fund of Central Ohio for partnering with us on this series this year. Our 2020 series recognized the 100th anniversary of women's rights to vote by exploring barriers facing women and how each of us can contribute to reducing gender discrimination. These insightful conversations focused on voting, housing, housing discrimination, health disparities, and overcoming violence against women. If you missed any of our previous sessions, they are all available for you to view at your convenience at our Department of Neighborhoods Facebook page. Today, we will conclude our series with a discussion on pay equity and the impact of COVID-19. I wanna thank our moderator, my friend and our city auditor, Megan Kilgore, and the tremendous panel of experts who are joining us today. We appreciate this opportunity to gain your insight and to learn how we can all make a difference. This Lunch and Learn series directly is directly aligned with the work we do in the Department of Neighborhoods to support Mayor Ginther's equity agenda. Through the department's Community Relations Commission, we help our residents understand and navigate protections against discrimination that exist. If you believe you have been a subject of discrimination, please contact our department and the Community Relations Commission at 614-645-1993. I would also like to thank Community Relations Commissioner Allison Poirier for helping to organize today's session. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Barbara Smoot, who will offer welcome remarks from the Columbus Women's Commission. Thank you, Director William Scott. My name is Barb Smoot, and it gives me great pleasure to represent the Columbus Women's Commission here today. The Columbus Women's Commission is an advisory body to Mayor Andrew Ginther to work on advancing the economic well-being of women in our community. This commission was founded in January of 2017 and is comprised of a diverse group of 24 individuals who are passionate about the economic well-being and health of women in our community. It is chaired by First Lady, First Lady Shannon Ginther, and these individuals are volunteers who support her in the vision of our leadership to advance women in the community. Our work is designed to complement and further propel the work of community organizations with similar goals for women in our community. And we use our positionality to bring issues to the forefront, forefront of policy processes, build awareness through coalition building, and working with our community partners. What we do, we are focused on dismantling the number of barriers that women face in our community that impede their economic livelihood. We are focused on four key areas that we have identified that hold women back. And when women are held back in our communities, our families suffer, our businesses suffer, and our communities suffer. The four key areas that we are focused on are health, and that's ensuring that women have access to health care, preventive health care, and reproductive rights, and, and mental health and well being. We are also focused on housing. It is important to look at the evictions that women and families face and also ensure that our families have affordable housing in our community. The third area of focus is gender equity in the workplace. This group is charged with finding ways to eliminate some of the gender disparity and racial disparity that people that work in our, our companies and organizations may face. And then lastly, workforce development. How do we build a pipeline of career opportunities for women so that they can earn a living wage in our community? And that gives you a good overview of the commission. You're welcome to visit our website. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Sarah Preezer of the Women's Fund of Central Ohio so that she can share a little bit about the amazing work that they do to, to uplift women. Thank you. Barb, thank you so much. It's such an honor to uh, be a part of today and to have been a part of the incredible uh, thought leadership and partnership that's really uh, you know, brought this entire series, this entire 
year to fruition. Um, so the Women's Fund of Central Ohio is a public foundation addressing social change and gender equity. We are focused on economic empowerment and leadership for girls. And we mobilize the community by investing in long-term and strategic chain, change in research, grant making, programming, raising awareness, driving policy, and making sure that together we are collectively working so that all women can thrive. Um, you know, this entire series, this entire year has brought the most critical issues to the forefront that we really need to be addressing if we want women and girls in our community to thrive. Um, and it is with that eye to the future and really applying an intersectional lens, which is why the Women's Fund said, yes, we have to be a part of this. Um, and so, you know, today, why today matters. You know, originally I know that we were set to really just talk about um, pay equity. And I say just as if it's just some small thing. It's a massive issue that we all need to collectively come together and address. Um, but it was because of the incredibly, you know, the, the incredible foresight and thoughtfulness of the, the commission and the partners who said we really need to think about um, making this timely and relevant and addressing how COVID-19 has added that extra layer of impact. So um, before you get to hear from the amazing panelists, I do want to share some data and really paint the picture of the history of this issue and why it matters. Um, and they're going to bring it to light for you. Um, and so, you know, at the Women's Fund, we have been looking at um, pay equity and equal pay for many, many years. And what we know is that over history, there have been a lot of efforts to try and make sure that we do have um, equal pay because ultimately, not only is it the right thing to do, but it it will be the you know one of the hugest economic drivers for our nation not just our community to really thrive um and we know that it's narrowing but just not fast enough um and so you know when we were looking at um equal pay most recently in central ohio what we found is that for the median annual er earnings for full-time year-round workers when compared to white men um for asian american women it was about 79 cents to the dollar for black women, it was 65 cents to the dollar. And for Latinas, it was 60 cents to the dollar. For white women, it was 82 cents to the dollar. And I think that really brings to light why it's so critical that we do apply an intersectional lens and ask those really thoughtful questions. Well, what and, why and how? Um, and so, you know, that's looking at, at those earnings, right, at the wage gap. But the other questions that we ask is, how are women um, able to provide for their families and what is impacting that? Um, so, you know, what we know is that women graduate high school and college at higher rates than men, but they still make up two thirds of all minimum wage workers. And that often it's women who are segregated into low paying jobs, things like as childcare, um, you know, healthcare, home healthcare workers that have been driving these huge gaps. But we also know that even though the wage gap alone is estimated to cost millennial women over a million dollars in their lifetime, when we look at um, the broader issue of, of wealth and savings and how a woman might be able to weather an economic crisis like we are experiencing with COVID-19, they're far less prepared. So those were, I just shared with you the, the statistics on you know, the earnings gap, the wage gap, but when you look at the wealth gap, all single women on average own 40 cents to the dollar. For Latinas, it's eight cents to the dollar. And for black women, it's only two cents to the dollar. So it's really important that we do bring in all of these layers of the, the lived experiences and thinking about if we know that single black women in our community are owning two cents to the dollar, how are they being impacted by COVID-19 and how could they ever be prepared to weather that storm? So we know that it's really important, yes, to address the wage gap and to provide a holistic approach when doing so. Um, when we started to study the wealth gap, you know, what we found is that, um, you know, about of, uh, from all of the local respondents, about 30% said that the reasons that were really holding them back from building wealth were things like job loss, low wages, business failure, um, and healthcare costs. And we know that those are the four things that are going to be accelerated because of COVID-19 and what it's causing. Um, but we also know that women truly are on the front lines of, of this crisis and the solutions, right? Um, so we know that in Ohio, over two thirds of all frontline workers are women. Women. And when we look at childcare and social services, it's 85%. And in healthcare, 80%. So it is truly women who are on those front lines, but also 
most impacted by COVID-19. And so um, I'm so excited that we have this incredible panel of thought leaders, um, brilliant women leaders in our community who are going to share with you really how you can be a part of solutions and what we all need to do to making sure that women and girls in our community have opportunity and to really understand the heart of the issue and what you can do about it. Um, and so with that, I'm so honored to introduce your brilliant moderator um, for this session, Columbus City Auditor, Megan Kilgore. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to everyone who is tuning in from home and work today. I'm Megan Kilgore, I'm your moderator, and I'm excited to be here because this panel is our, the right, um, frankly, the right women at the table to start taking some, some action here. So let's set the stage. You know, we know that economic opportunity is not distributed equally. And it's nothing new, but COVID-19 and the nationwide protests for racial justice have really clearly helped to delineate the significant gaps between black, brown, and white communities and men and women in lots of measurements like health, wealth, life expectancy, job quality, home ownership, and many other metrics. And the one that we're gonna hear you know, about today is pay equity. As the pandemic continues to affect lives all across this country and all across this world, we can already see how COVID and its corresponding economic fallout are having a regressive effect on pay equity and gender equality. McKinsey, uh, consulting you know, organization, McKinsey estimates that women's jobs are 1.8 times more vulnerable to the crisis than men's jobs. And Sarah just touched on that and kind of brought some statistics home. Nationally, women make up about 39% of employment, but they account for 54% of the overall job loss as a result of the pandemic. Much of this is of course due to the types of jobs affected, but one reason that we're really starting to get our arms around is frankly the greater effect, why this is affecting women you know, more, is because that the pandemic is really causing a, um, a significant burden now of unpaid care. And that is of course disproportionately carried by women. So this among other factors means that women's employment is dropping faster than average even after we make some adjustments for the types of work that men and women do. Here in Columbus, two in every five black women lost their jobs as a result of COVID. That's, that's a significant, that is a, a, a something that's going to affect our economy and our social services for many, many years to come. So clearly we have lots of work to do, but here to help us are our fantastic panelists. And I'm gonna, here's how we're gonna kind of run this today. It's gonna be, dynamic. I'm going to try and keep an eye on the chat feature, but here's what I'd like to do is I'm going to first kick it off with introductions of our panelists. We're going to go through some moderated questions and then throughout, I would love for you guys to chime in. If you have questions for any of the panelists, chime in. I'll try and keep an eye. Pedro, who's helping run behind the scenes, will do so as well. And then we'll also leave some time at the end for some Q&A. So let's get started. First off, um, someone who I get to have the pleasure of working with frequently because she is not only the president pro tem of council, but she is the finance chair, which means we talk all the time. And she's also a dear friend. It is council member Liz Brown. So Liz, why don't you start off by sharing a little bit about your daily work and your evening work slash weekend slash 24 seven work as a, as a council member. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, auditor. I'm going to, I'm going to call you our auditor today. Operator, I like it. I'll take okay. it. Okay. Yeah, I just thought of that, so I hope it's funny. Um, I, I, <laughs> I really appreciate the chance to be here today, and I just really appreciate our Department of Neighborhoods for convening a discussion as timely as this. Um, and the the discussing the pay gap and addressing the pay gap is always a timely issue because it affects our community broadly. Um, and I want to thank Barb Smoot um, for her efforts on really for the last um, four years on addressing the pay gap here in Columbus. But it is more timely than ever. Um, so as a city council member, um, I'm, I'm president pro tem. Um, finance chair, you know, I'm, I'm taking a look at the city's budget. I am uh, trying to address sort of broad economic and um, social and health needs of our community. Um, 
I do that around the clock. These uh, elected uh, positions are that way. They really are around the clock. Um, but what's so critical is that we understand how um, what may be uh, sidelined as a niche issue, like a women's issue, is really not um, a niche issue. These issues really impact the overall picture of the health of Columbus. And Auditor Kilgore um, uh, was outlining that in her remarks. Um, Sarah and Barb both laid the statistics out um, so wonderfully for how the position of women's economic security in our community matters for everyone. You know, I think that it is unfortunately uh, kind of an age old story that women's labor or at least a story as old as our country, right? That women's labor is underpaid and underrecognized and even ignored, um, especially the work of Black and Latinx women. But the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed that age-old story center stage. I will just end quickly. Um, I know these are just broad um, introductory remarks. I will just end quickly that um, I, I see that happening for women, not just in the work that they are paid to do, but the work that they are not paid to do. The work women do to hold our communities together. Whether or not a woman is a parent, and, and I am one, um, and I understand that unpaid labor um, that women engage in every single day that's underrecognized and often ignored, and really not uh, addressed and um, celebrated and recognized in their workplaces. Um, you know, and I understand that, but even women who don't have children are, are caregiving. I mean, most women you meet are providing some care to family members, to communities. And I think that understanding that that whole woman and what she does for our community is critically important to building a Columbus that I'm proud to leave to my kids, right? Building that better city for the future. So I will stop right there, um, uh, Auditor Kilgore, and let you go on with the rest. Uh, lovely, um, thank you, Liz. And you know, let's um, let's go next to let's go to Davia Stevenson. Share a little bit about what you are doing as your organization and uh, the work that you're doing in the community. All right. Well, I'm Davia Williams Stevenson. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So, as as Councilman Brown was talking about the whole person, I really will be speaking to that that unpaid person, the life that, that you're living in your home and with your family and your relationships. But I'm also here as a representative of the National Coalition of Black Women, the Central Ohio chapter. And we are, we unapologetically advocate for black women and girls um, in the areas of health, education, and economic uh, disparities, trying to promote equity as, as all of you are, are doing. Um, and so my lens, however, will be to the emotional, psychological, relational impact of these pay equity issues on the larger scale of the larger under the larger umbrella, excuse me, of, um, of uh, the economic impact of COVID-19. Um, as you can imagine, stress levels are very high and there's going to be some foundational things that we can do for ourselves without adding one more job for, an, for a woman to do to help maintain her emotional, mental, relational health so she can be present um, in her home, in her workplace, should she be so fortunate, right, to still have a workplace um, in this COVID environment. So um, that will be my lens. I hope to contribute at some place in the conversation. Thank you very, very much. Um, how about we go next to Mylene Samboy from Synergy. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm Mylene Samboy. I am the co-founder and the director of development for Femergy. I also serve on the board of the Create Columbus. Um, and there we work with young professionals. So here at Femergy, we work really hard to equip women and girls um, to navigate and sort through you know, gender, economic, and social barriers um, so that they can grow up healthy, uh, educated, and independent. Um, our programs um, help girls and women explore and celebrate their strengths, their voices, who they are today, and who they will become in the future. And with everything happening right now, uh, just really broadly with COVID-19, we had to really quickly shift and pivot on how to help our girls and our women survive, 
right? Because we're in a pandemic. So how do we survive? And that means providing literacy classes for both young girls and women, because young girls now have to help moms, right? And parents kind of navigate this financial crisis. So we'll talk more about that. So my focus will be more, how do we help in the young people and also um, the women? And then providing resources like food, housing, uh, you know, medical, mental health, creating support systems. So helping them with that. Once we get them to survive, then we work really hard in empowering them to thrive. So that is what I'm here for and excited to be part of the conversation. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Barb Smoot from Weld. Share a little bit more about Weld, your agenda for the remaining parts of 2020, and about you uh, and your all of your professional roles in the community. Thank you. So in my role as president and CEO of Weld, Women for Economic and Leadership Development, we focus on creating strategies that will develop and advance women's leadership to strengthen the economic prosperity of the communities that we serve. We know that when you have invested in a woman, you have in effect invested in the community. So it is important for us, number one, to make sure people are aware of the business case of why you start with investing with women and, and women entrepreneurs and how it helps communities. We also equip women with the skill sets needed to advance in their careers and encourage women to pay for their success. With respect to the work that we do on the Columbus Women's Commission, initially we started our focus with uh, pay disparity. But the interesting thing about pay disparity that is the end result of a number of other things that did not go right that, that in processes of organizations. So back in 2017, we created the pay uh, the Columbus version of a pay equity pledge, which is called the Columbus Commitment. And so far, over 270 employers in this community have signed the have signed this pledge. What is different about this work and the work that Weld does? You know, if you think back to the hashtag Me Too movement, and, and you see it even now with uh, Black Lives Matter, companies are endorsing their support for both of these issues, and then there isn't necessarily a plan of attack and next things that they need to do in order to make an impact and to change these things. Um, many of them have done things like implicit bias, and here's the thing with implicit bias training. I like to use the analogy that implicit bias training is the warm up to a workout. It gets you ready to have an effective workout, but it is not the workout itself. So if you stop with implicit bias training, it's like you just put your exercise clothes on, did some stretches, and then called it a day, right? So what we've done for the Columbus Women's Commission is to say, okay, what is that roadmap to help companies figure out what they need to do to make an impact with the numbers? And it begins with learning about pay disparities. You know, what's going on in your organization? Understand the impact of when uh, women and people of color are not paid equitably in your organization. Analyze what is causing it. This just doesn't happen on its own. There's something causing it. Figure out what those policies are that you need to change, procedures that you need to change so that you can fix it. And then in the way of the Columbus community, when we learn how to fix things like this, we collaborate and share best practices, right? It, we want the whole community be, to be uplifted. So as we continued our work with the uh, gender equity in the workplace, we started with pay disparities and now have gone on to look at childcare issues, um, a number of different things that have impacted women, because as many of these amazing panelists have, have, have included in their comments, um, COVID-19 has laid bare a lot of the issues and challenges that we knew as a community that women faced. Barb, I love that you are starting a conversation with a call to action, and because I really wanna book in today with action steps as well. But let me ask you, you know, for those listeners right now who are saying, all right, that sounds great, I have a small business, where can these folks go to get access to these resources? So the Columbus Women's Commission has a, a playbook. It has a list of things you can do, a policy uh, with a number of steps that you can do. And these are actionable things. Number one, if you are interviewing for people or taking applications, don't ask about pay salary history. 
because we all know women have been underpaid from the get-go. And if you start basing their, their pay on what they used to make in a previous job, and it continues that uh, pay inequity that women face. Um, Council Member Brown, um, she's been phenomenal talking about paid family leave, uh, affordable childcare. These are the very actionable, concrete things that employers can take. And, and I agree, uh, Auditor Kilgore, it sounds like a lot of this stuff is high in the sky. And what we've done is actually broke it down in bullet point format. Here's a list, here's a menu of things that you can choose to do inside your company. I, I love that because in conversations that I've had, a lot of times business owners are almost um, afraid to acknowledge when they take that kind of hard look in the mirror. And I think the important thing is to look, you know, don't be afraid of um, not having an ideal score at the beginning, but look towards end goals. You have to figure out where you are today to see where you're going to go in the future. And I love that the Women's Commission and others are doing this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to ask the question of, of Davia. And the other panelists chime in too. It's clear that you all have touch points to the pay equity initiative. What is also clear is that as a result of the pandemic, things have definitely gotten worse for a lot of our communities here in Columbus and Central Ohio. So maybe right off the bat, you know, share a little bit about what you're seeing, what your organizations are seeing uh, with respect to the women in our various communities here. Yeah, so I've got a kind of a two hats I'm sort of wearing today. So I hope to, uh, to uh, switch between them with some, some ease. Um, let me begin with the mental health space. Now we don't have good data yet because we're still un undergoing this, right? Um, but anecdotally, um, with my clientele and with a few other women that I've just taken time to do some interviews just to see where you are with, with some things. Um, the impact of all these additional hats they're wearing, not just the economic impact, but when you're caring for people in your home, when you're caring for elders, the sandwich type of situation, um, how are you even fortified to show up to think about these issues? Um, I try to tell my clientele that, um, so let me back up a little bit. The majority of my clients are going to be women, adult women. That's because adult women are gonna make a phone call for anybody else in their household or anyone else they know. If I'm gonna work with a teen, it's because the mother called. If I'm gonna work with a couple, it's because the wife called. If I'm gonna work with a family, it's right. So adult women make up, I guess, 70% of my practice. So that's who I spend a lot of my time talking to. Now I'm in a private practice. And so the majority, I will say, of the women that come to me are by choice. I don't have anyone mandated. Um, they choose to come to me and i'm grateful that at least in this day and age in this time this COVID response um, mental health care is accessible via virtual right it takes away some of the barriers of trying to leave your house and get somewhere when you've got your kids at home and you're trying to homeschool or when you're trying to figure out how to pay the next bill because you're you've been furloughed from your job um and so i i start that conversation with a level of have some grace for yourself Everyone take about 25% off of your capacity. Whether you feel a direct impact um, uh, financially, whether you are now home in a uh, relationship that wasn't healthy to begin with and now you're in the same space. If you don't even have those, the noise of COVID, the fear of going out, do we stay in? How do we go out? We thought this thing was out there to kill us. We had to come home. Now we're told to go back out to this thing that's still out there wanting to kill us. Take 25% off your personal capacity, all right? That's grace. And you operate with what you have left. So now add on the fact that life didn't stop because COVID added some additional layers to existing problems, right? So say on a given day, you feel like you got about half your ability. So if you try to operate like you have all of your capacity, you're going into debt against yourself. You know how hard it is to get out of debt. It's going to cost, the bill will come due at some point in time. And it's usually going to be your physical health, your mental health, your relational health, your capacity to pivot with this economic um, uh, situation that we're in. Um, and so that's the groundwork that I lay for women. Have some grace first. Take a deep breath. And I'll talk a little bit about that directly. 
I'm going to read a little bit because I want to make sure I don't um, misrepresent um, the coalition's work. If I can get my document up and what we're doing to address these things. <clears throat> Excuse me. While you're pulling that up, I want to kind of chime in because I do a, I do a lot of public speaking, just like just like Liz, we're out there all the time. And what's challenging about COVID right now, I think keep getting asked, you know, keep getting asked. Educate us on the economic impacts of COVID and what are the, what's the likely scenario for the rest of 2020, what's going to happen in 2021. You know, here's what's really interesting about COVID is that unlike the Great Depression or the Great Recession, COVID preys upon many more um, feelings, emotions. You know, we know we don't only have to worry about our economic stability, our job stability, our families, you know, well-being, food. But we also have to worry about, um, frankly, the cognitive side, the mental health side, which is the inability to see loved ones, the inability to see, you know, grandchildren. Um, you also have the inability to actually be with people, you know. And so, from a from a revenue model, you know, those factors we've had to start thinking about how to quantify sentiment. And you know, we know in the retail space, consumer sentiment has always played a role. But what is the likelihood that people will feel comfortable? you know, going back to work? What is the likelihood that someone's going to feel comfortable going back to their place of, of, of you know, church, their, their school, you know, whatever? That is an area that is brand new to this, really, this, I don't know, these models, and it's challenging. And so I love that you're just kicking us off with mental health right off the bat. The bottom line is we don't know. We don't know how long this will, will, will exist. We don't know how long the, you can assume the economic impact will last for years, uh, take some time to catch up. So we don't know. Um, and so we have to rely on those things that tend to give us, uh, tend to fortify us anyway, right? Our our spiritual life. Well, it doesn't look like it used to because we don't gather together. When are we comfortable? I will tell you that in my experience with my clients, you find an interesting kind of back and forth. Um, those who said, okay, you know what? I'm feeling ready to see my family, I'm ready to worship in congregation, I, my, children need, my, my children need fellowship, I need a break, I'm ready. Let's figure out how to enter this world, um, this new space of, with co exist, coexist with COVID is what I'm trying to say. And then you find that once they take that step, there's, it's just this roller coaster. And so I can't really I don't think anyone can really speak to how long this will go. And so the attitude or the, the approach of how can I be best fortified for whatever comes my way as I have to, looks like the, 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 uh, the approach is gonna be pivot, pivot, pivot. How do I pivot with little resources? Well, you are your main resource. You are your main resource. And you're the first thing that gets overlooked. You have introduced a great topic right now, and I'm going to kick this off to, uh, how about Mylene to start? You know, there have been a number of economic crises down to the individual level because of this pandemic. Unemployment, um, trouble paying rent, uh, mortgage payments, um, you know, small business owners, how do you meet payroll? Um, how do you, you know, put on your backs, you know, your, on, your, on your credit cards, basically, the cost of PPE, you know? So, what has happened is federal policy has gotten, or federal policy makers have attempted to solve for each of those issues, right? However, glaringly missing from that conversation and something that policymakers have not reacted to is that of the child care crisis. Why do you think that is? It's sad to say, but I thought about this and I said, how are you going to say this, Mylene? Be careful, but here it is. Because it is, um, child care affects women more than it affects men. Right, so it's kind of, there's some men, of course, there are single fathers and they're faced with this, but if you look at the numbers, the facts, um, sadly, uh, people kind of seem to take action when it affects them. This economy, this crisis, this pandemic affected everyone. Childcare has been an issue forever for women and single parents. Um, we see that every day in our programs. We had, especially for our Enrichment Institute for Women, we had to make adjustments to make sure that childcare was not a barrier for women to attend our program, right? Because these are programs that they needed in order to elevate, to reach their goals, right? Like Barb was saying, there's a lot of skills that they need to learn. And many times their first uh, barrier was, I don't have childcare. I'm like, bring the child. 
we'll take care of it, right? How many companies and organizations, I mean, look at Congress or whoever, how many are we sitting there thinking, how can we eliminate this barrier? How can we provide funding to provide childcare, right? Because that is the biggest thing. So yes, it affected us more and nobody has said nothing as much. I know some great people in this panel have doing a lot of great work, but the pandemic is different because it affected men and they're like, oh no, now this is a big issue. Yes, it has been a big issue. Childcare has been a big issue. Now, how do we all together come together for this? There's funding that has to be available. Um, some of the women that we're seeing are coming to us with, okay, now I might either, I, I was let go of my job or my hours were reduced, which now I can't even afford what I couldn't afford before, as you saw, um, Latina women, uh, we earn, we're like the, the class that, learn, that earns the less, right? The least uh, when it comes to a dollar compared to a man. I got to tell you this because I read this and I almost had a heart attack. Is it, um, so if you know um, Latina Equal Pay Day, why is it in November? And I found a research that said that it's in November because it would take a Latina 10 months plus a day plus all of a full year to make the same amount of money that it would take a male white man. Okay, that alone, think about that. We will have to work so much harder, right? And then you adding the childcare and families. And a lot of people don't see, as Latinas, like we, and I speak for myself, I'm Dominican, we take care of our household, our community, and many times our families back home. And that is something that is not taken into consideration, right? When we're facing this, these things. Um, and I think going forward, what I would love to see is how we all come together to figure out how do we truly address this childcare issue? Because now um, with schools being, are they gonna be virtual or not? How are, we, how are we addressing this? A lot of women wanna start their own business because this is the only answer they see. If I stay home, I can start my own business. I can take care of my child and I will attempt right? To do it all the best way I can. Are we providing resources for funding for women to have their business? Are we providing funding to help them to thrive? The first few years of businesses are difficult. Businesses, before you send your money somewhere else, outsource it, keep it local. Help our communities thrive by giving, you know, jobs and contracts and work to the people that really needed a lot of women. I, I love that. Can I jump in on the child care piece real quick, Auditor? Um, uh, so I, I think that um, that is really dead on about sort of why it was a missing piece. But I will add to that that not only is it a lot of men who made these uh, federal response policies, but a lot of kind of older men who are out of child care years. And the, um, the child care landscape has changed a lot in the last few decades. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, they're also maybe of a generation where men were even less keyed in on this issue. You might be able to hear my daughter screaming in the background. I apologize. She's four. She's having a situation with TV at the moment, which she knows she's not supposed to be watching at the moment. <laughs> Believe me, we're all for screen time around here, but we try to regulate it. Um, and so child care, child care costs for the average family, I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, but um, bear with me, for the average um, uh, sort of median middle income family, child care, if you have two kids in child care, can be a third of your take home pay, one third on child care. And this is a phenomenon that our policymakers have been far too slow to keep up with. So child care has been an issue before the advent of the COVID-19 crisis, um, in part because I think we've never treated it like the infrastructure that it is. Um, we leave childcare up to the private marketplace. We recognize education as a public good. And while we don't fulfill the equity promise of public education as a nation, we at least say we're trying. And when it comes to early childhood, we don't even pretend to try. We leave it to families to figure out. We leave it to the private marketplace. Uh, you know, and, and the definition of, of a sort of a private marketplace is you know, that some, some will fail and some will succeed. Um, and no kids should be able to fail, right? That's on all of us. So the, the marketplace of childcare um, providers have really been left out as small businesses because they're mostly owned by women. 
they're largely owned by women of color. And um, that means that with these new restrictions on how they can do business, class sizes, sanitation, necessary public health restrictions, they're not able to meet the bottom line because they have to meet a bottom line because they're, pri they're lar largely private. Um, due to that, our recognition in the city of Columbus that if we don't address this problem, we could lose, and this is real, half of our childcare slots. 200,000 children in Ohio could lose their access to childcare because we don't support our operators. The federal bills have not done nearly enough. I've written letters to our federal delegation to invest $50 billion in the next COVID stimulus package. But meantime, we've invested $6.2 million. We just did this Monday night as part of a family infrastructure package that I spearheaded. Um, invested $6.2 million in the child care providers here locally, who we know rely on state funding and county funding to come to, to get by because they serve typically our lower income families. There's Head Start, uh, which only goes up to about 130% of federal poverty line. That's a state dictated number. Ohio is at the bottom of the pack. We have the most restrictions on who can access um, uh, uh, state funding and um, it makes it harder for middle income families to afford childcare. I'm going on a bit here, but getting to my main point is that our $6.2 million is supposed to help try to plug this hole because we can't afford to lose that kind of access in our city. It affects family stability and it affects our economic future. Liz, I love that you got into this on Monday because I wrote down, actually, I wrote down from your remarks. You stated that childcare needs to be funded like the essential infrastructure that it is. I think that's, that's absolutely true. And uh, Barb, were you getting ready to chime in? Yes, I wanted to add, um, part of why we're here, where we are today, is the lack of uh, viewing policy and how we do things from a gender lens and, and, and a lens um, of racial disparity. Now, we all heard um, President Pro Tem uh, uh, Brown rattle off the data and talk about the disciplined work that, that she and her peers have been doing to understand this. It begins with doing that disciplined work and having voices at the table who are willing to look at the data, raise the issues, and speak up. I, it's getting the women leaders at the table when these discussions are being had. And, and people who are not afraid to do the work that's necessary to try to understand this. Um, individuals who are currently going through, we heard her child, you know, you know, God bless her, uh, sounded wonderful to me. Um, someone who's actually going through that and will have that struggle during the school year of what they're gonna do. So I'm gonna keep with Barb for a second. You know, last, um, last week, uh, Governor DeWine mandated a mask in an effort to really mitigate the spread of, of COVID and keep businesses open. You know, as we continue to reimagine, I love the word reimagine, um, this new economy, what policies will have the most positive impacts, do you think, on pay equity? Absolutely doing um, the, the data analysis. So number one, as employers look to furlough individuals, you've heard what has happened to women of color in particular. They, the analysis needs to occur to see who all is getting ready to be impacted by this particular decision to furlough these particular individuals. Are we inadvertently uh, um, causing more of one different demographic to be negatively impacted more so than another? That discipline is, is vitally important or else you find yourself doing damage control and trying to fix problems that you created for yourself. Right. Um, bring that discipline to the process. Um, and, and again, looking at the policies that a company has, and it's it very thoughtful. Um, and, I, and I like to say that companies don't necessarily do things out of being mean-spirited, just not thinking about what it is their policies are doing. Uh, let's celebrate the ones who are getting it right and ask them to help other companies and, and, and share their best practices with other companies for what they've done uh, to address pay disparity. 
we got a question from an audience member named Allison. Allison's asking about, you know, maybe I'm going to pitch this to Liz first. You know, what are, you know, what, what can individuals do to try and get the attention? Because this is so important, this child care crisis. How is the best method for these individuals getting in touch with their policymakers? Well, um, that's a great question. And right now, the uh, next federal response package is moving its way through Congress. And um, Mitch McConnell just introduced the HEALS Act, which is his response to what um, Nancy Pelosi passed through the House, which is the HEROES Act. The HEROES Act included investment in child care. Um, the HEALS Act did not. Um, you should write your congressional members, you should write your senators, um, tell them that uh, they need to pay attention to these issues of childcare. Um, and you should also hold them accountable at the ballot box in November. Um, most of your federal office holders are on the ballot um, uh, this coming November. President, Congress, um, neither of our US senators. But um, write them now and hold them accountable. Um, I think at the state level, I will just um, be very clear that state and local governments are in a different budget situation because we have to balance our budget every year and the federal government is allowed to borrow. Um, at the state level, there are um, some federal dollars still available to allocate to child care providers. And I have been uh, pushing to do that. Um, but they are in a balancing act because of their budget situation being different from federal. Same thing with city. Now, what we're talking about here is a response to a crisis. All of this, right? We're talking about COVID, a response to a crisis. What I know that Megan, Auditor Kilgore, is focused on, and, um, and, and also um, all of my panelists, or how, my fellow panelists, how we recover from the crisis. Specifically on childcare, we can't let up on our advocacy on this issue post-crisis. Because remember, I was saying the system was broken before we got into this. Um, so I'm really asking everyone who, um, uh, who, is in, who cares about childcare issues to keep the heat on all of us to do better once we're out of this. Just because we're navigating a recession doesn't mean we can't double down on um, once and for all taking an equity approach to early childhood education. Um, my dear friend, Barb Smoot, also reminded me that complete the census, that's another key piece of this, complete the census and tell everyone you know to complete the census because that's where we get um, our numbers. Uh, Davia, we had a good question from, I believe, uh, Elise. Um, in the, uh, the chat as well, you know, let's talk a little bit about longer term implications, you know, right off the bat, we know that, you know, um, switching one's job from full time to part time or even worse, losing one's job is going to carry, you know, uh, catastrophic consequences for some and certainly erode any financial stability. So one of the questions that Elise asked, what are resources, you know, that might be available today, but I think Liz, to your point, we have to look longer term. So maybe I put on your, your kind of your thinking hat, what are going to be the long-term impacts that you're forecasting and what resources might be available with the organizations with which you, you participate? So with the um, coalition, National Coalition of 100 Black Women, and we know that that's very layered. Um, we were talking about child care issues. Uh, President Pro Tem, um, Liz Brown, actually had a question about that. We're talking about child care issues and how, how do they get access to resources when some are considered small businesses what 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 pool do they do they draw from <clears throat> i don't have an answer for that but i know that's one of the questions that we need to um to address i will admit that i'm struggling a little bit with the answer to this question as i um so have on my mental health hat today um i know that the coalition um addresses <clears throat> excuse me i'm sorry i'm losing my voice today um <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Come back to okay. me. Okay. I, 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 can I yeah. answer the question that, yeah. that you had that she, you know, she hears a lot about how businesses can access this pool of resources. So the 6.2 million that we invested um, that we just passed on Monday will go to specific providers. Um, who accept publicly funded child care dollars from the state and also grant dollars from the city. We invest close to $4 million every year in child care providers that serve families under 300% of federal poverty. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons we go up to 300% of federal poverty is we understand that hole between Head Start 
um, and actually being able to afford your childcare is giant. Um, so these are a, sort of a set of providers um, that provide high quality care. They're, they're at least three star rated by the state and then also um, serve this group of children that we know would not have access without it. Um, so to your question, Davia, that's a kind of predetermined list. If you in the women that you serve also know providers who aren't in that system of, of state publicly funded childcare dollars, but are looking for business loans, we did just open up a new pool through our economic development efforts of business loans that child care providers are absolutely able to apply for. It's just different from our $6.2 million program. So I'm just, I'll have to come back. I can, I get my voice together. I, <laughs> you know, um, I will be back. <laughs> oh, sorry, no worries. The, the child care cliff too, you know, we haven't really even touched upon that, but my gosh, it is a, it is a, an economic challenge. Um, it's a, absolutely. I know the Women's Fund has done great work to bring that, you know, to light to reporting. Um, one thing that I want to add from kind of my office and what we're seeing is what remote work is doing to the pay equity conversation as well. You know, very factually, um, that is going to take, you know, um, it's very simple. It's very easy to see the economic difference already unfolding because of, of, of the uh, remote work capabilities. Um, but here's what I want to do. Now that we have a few moments left, I kind of want to end by talking about local action. And, you know, I'm going to start with, with Mylene. You know, we know that progress has certainly been made in closing pay gaps. But here's the problem. Thanks to, you know, the pandemic, a lot of that progress has either been, you know, stalled or maybe even eliminated in cases, right? So, um, and there's probably never been a time that's more important for that progress to be in place. So in light of COVID and the pandemic, how are you, you know, if, if you're a small business owner, you're, you know, listening in today, you are an employee, what are some practical solutions that our, our folks online can be employing to help address the pay gap? Thank you. So there's a few things. Um, and before I address that, that's okay. I wanted to share with you that there's a, an important um, moment for us to really, for, for all of us to realize that one, sure one way, that's my iPhone watch, excuse me, one way does not <laughs> fix everybody's issue, right? So sometimes we, we come up with this solution and we're like, oh, we're just going to apply this method and everybody's going to be fine. Every household is different. A very important thing that we're doing at Femergy is really helping and training our girls and women to pivot so every home is different and therefore how can you know what people really need you ask them so we're hosting virtual conversations with girls but also with women to figure out what do you need right because we may have an idea what people need and when you call them and speak with them it's different so what do you need based on that then we can you know connect them to the proper resources um, in the community to really help them address the, the immediate need Second, if you're a small business, I, I have talked to a lot of people that have reached out to me. I help people start their businesses. It's one of my consulting work. So I know that when you have a business, it's really difficult sometimes to access resources. There are a lot of resources there. One of my biggest concerns is that people have no idea how to access the resources. So they're there. How do you access them? We have partnered with a couple of financial experts in the community. So when someone is like, I have a business, I don't know where to go for help. You know, you can reach out to Femergy. We will connect you with these financial experts to help you access the resources that you need, right? Or put you in the right path. So that's number one. There are resources. Ask. We're here. All of us can be a, a resource for you. Use us. Please use us. Um, number two is when you talk about what can people do in the, in the job. So I can tell you this. Um, even before this, women were afraid, I think. We were afraid to ask for what we, what we deserve, our value, our worth. First, we questioned it because a lot of people made us question it. Then when we were like, okay, I think I'm confident. I went to this program. I know how to negotiate. You go and negotiate. And the person that you're talking to about flexibility to stay at home and be with your kids but still do an incredible job, which as women, we do it. Number two, you deserve more money, not because you're a woman, but because you have worked so hard and your skills and capacity and experience Prove it that you are worth every single penny you're asking for. What I have found, and this is a real life example, one of the women that came through our program, she has been in her corporate 
work for maybe over 15 years in the same position. After going through a program, she went to her boss and said, hey, I would like to be a vice president. You know, I thought that was really great. I'm thinking, right? And she said it very well. She said, I've been investing in my personal and professional growth. I am ready for leadership. I would like to be a vice president. I've been in the company for 15 years. I thought as a former manager that the response would have been something very positive. What she got was pushed back. Oh, but do you know how much work that's going to take? Well, I mean, do you even know what this is going to be? And she's like, yes. And I am asking you for guidance to help me reach that, right? So as if you are in leadership, whether it be a, you're in corporate, you're in an organization, you own your own company. If you have employees, talk to them, right? Figure out, look at your payroll. Is everybody getting paid equally? Are they getting paid what they deserve based on their experience? Forget the way, like, like Barb said, forget the whole gender thing, right? And don't look at them as a man or woman. Are they getting paid what they're worth? Because if not, fix it. Number two, if they don't come to you because they're ready for leadership, talk to them about that. Because sometimes they're afraid because you shut them down before or, or they don't know how to approach you. So as managers, we have that responsibility to really talk to our people. If you're looking for work, do your research um, and make sure that you know what you're worth and ask for it. This is the best time. If you don't know how to do that and you're like, I'm not sure, we have resources to help you with that. And then I will say this, many times we are afraid, right, of what is going to come when you ask a question. The answer is always going to be no if you don't ask. That is going to be always the answer. No, if you don't ask. And all of us together have a responsibility to be intentional about how do we work for ourselves to advocate. We have to advocate for ourselves for what we need. You know, if you're staying home and you need time to be with your kids, you need a flexible schedule. You know, Michelle Obama shared in her book, you can ask for that and you can make it happen. And if that employer is not able to do that, because this is what's happening now, for Latinx and Latino community, we were already under some pressures, right? Because of biases of the work that we do. Now, sadly, some employers are treating this as an opportunity to oppress even more because you should be lucky to have a job. You should be lucky that I do this. And that is not correct. So together as a community, we need to figure out when we see things like that, speak up and let's get some help because no one should be oppressed more or ever for doing the work that they need because we're in the pandemic, right? Talking to Davia, this is gonna really hurt our mental health if we don't come together. And my last point is, I think as a community, we need to come together. A lot of us are doing many initiatives and many things. Are we talking to each other? What are you doing? What are we doing? How can we together come, you know, come together to impact a larger community, right? Because we all offer different things, but our people need everything. Everything that we all offer, they need it. So we gotta come together to do that. And if you have an hour a month of your time, can you invest that hour in somebody else? Can you mentor a young girl so she can learn about financial you know, literacy? She can have someone besides her parents or guardians that she can talk to, to look up to. One hour mentorship a month can really make a difference. You have the opportunity with us to do that, so reach out. But if it's not a girl, that's not your jam, then there's women that need your support and that need your mentorship. Mylene, that's an excellent point. Um, Davia, I'm gonna come to you, the same question. We only have a couple minutes, so just a couple high points. What would you recommend viewers do right now to employ? Yes, a couple. I wanted to mention organizations, like we've gotta have a resource list for organizations like Femergy. Like well, like the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. There's a Brown Girls Mentoring. There is women don't know, as Mylene uh, uh, mentioned, that they have this voice or how to ask this question because they've been socialized to be grateful for what you have. So, okay, I just should be glad that I have this title, have this job, what have you, and I've had a negative um, uh, response when I've spoken up. So whatever way through all their many organizations that are speaking to women on these on these subjects and i don't think um we've got to find a way to do a better job of connecting our women to other women who want to bring them along if you have a church community there are many different women in your church community that could take a moment to mentor someone else mental health we've got to stop seeing it as some sort of stigma 
we ought to be able to know what to do when we are dealing with depression or anxiety, just like we do when we have the common cold. Before that was a scary thing in this COVID situation, right? You know what to do. You're not judged if you have a cold. You, you drink water, you take cold medicines, you take, you know what to do. So when you're dealing with stress, when you're dealing with personal um, uh, areas where you are suppressed, depression, any of those things, that is normal. We are all, every one of us, going to have some episode at some point in our life, a clinically significant episode of depression, anxiety. We're all going to face grief and loss. And what we've been trained to do, socialized to do as women is, I just got to keep it moving. I can't deal with that. I push it aside. And so if we remove the stigma of getting some guidance, we can, we can be fortified to approach these things. I can connect my women to organizations like Femergy or Weld or what have you um, to, to personally fortify yourself to live in this environment, this extra COVID environment, but certainly all of these issues existed before. And we don't ask for help because we're either afraid to or feel we don't deserve to or somehow stigmatized because of it. And I think that's a big part of our role that we have to play. Lovely thoughts. Um, I'm gonna end with one last question to Barb and Liz both. Barb, I'll start with you. You know, wearing your weld and your Women's Commission hat, what is your one request of viewers today? Well, I put that in the chat function. It was actually two. You got to vote and you have to fill out that census. If you don't like what it is that you're seeing today and you don't fill out that ballot, then you get what you get. You heard a lot of wonderful ideas today, but I urge you to please do those two things. I'm with you. All right, Councilmember Brown, your trend. What's your request of our viewers? Uh, my request would be to follow the excellent advice of, uh, of these very smart women who've gone before me. Um, and then to also just recognize the reality that if we, that we cannot rebuild our economy or revitalize our communities, either in this crisis or after it, um, without investing in solutions that center women. Um, and that really means recognizing the dual role that women play as caregivers and breadwinners, um, and then responding in kind. So uh, we don't all have public policy portfolios or nonprofit organizations through which we can do our work. Um, follow what these women say for accessing their resources. And then one I will add, um, vote and fill out your census um, and underscore that. But one I will add is that even if you aren't an employer, please visit the Women's Commission website and look over their materials for employers because you can, if you feel comfortable and, and you know try to find your power and get comfortable doing it, go to your employer and say, I care about these issues. And here's a roadmap. Could we take this on as a company? Have that conversation with your supervisor or your employer. Um, and uh, to Barb's point, what she has found when doing this work for the Women's Commission is that often employers are open to things but don't know about them. And so um, I just appreciate this opportunity to be a part of the solution today um, and, and hope that these resources uh, will help others do so too. Thank you, Liz. All right, everyone, thank you so much for listening. On behalf of these wonderful panelists, the Department of Neighborhoods and Director Carla Williams-Scott, thank you for tuning in today, and we hope that you will stay not only in tune to the future events, but very, very active. Just reach out. Thanks all.